This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about development of a frost-hardy maize variety and a lot about assembling a Tripscom genome so that we can map uh, frost tolerance in Tripsicum. Grab the remote here. Uh, okay, so uh, just to motivate the project, um, plants with longer growing seasons accumulate more biomass. We're looking at uh, light capture efficiency in miscanthus and maize in side-by-side -side, uh, replicated field trials. Um, and we see that uh, miscanthus, due to emerging earlier and uh, senescing later in the season, is able to maximize uh, foliar canopy cover throughout the growing season um, and essentially do more photosynthesis, uh, resulting in 59% greater productivity. Um, so can we emulate this in maize? Right, so um, this is just a zoom in of the um, corn belts. We're looking at NDVI um, in uh, averaged over a two week window at the end of four months. Um, so as I cycle through here, we can see the greenness in, the laser is, yeah, the greenness in this kind of area right here, right in the corn belt, doesn't really kick in until the end of July, uh, which is after the summer solstice. So uh, basically half of our growing season is gone before maize really gets kicking. Um, now if we could develop a cold tolerant maize variety, um, it could potentially overwinter in the southeastern U.S. Uh, down here. It could be sown earlier in the Corn Belt in its main growing season, uh, potentially getting its, uh, its, its canopy out earlier and making better use of the growing season, uh, and also potentially be grown further north, um, potentially as a spring crop. So uh, in order to uh, study freezing tolerance um, and potentially identify traits to move over to maize, we're looking at this species called Tripsicum. Um, I'm realizing just now that I don't have a nice picture of Tripsicum here. Um, I have some pictures of sad Tripsicum a little bit later. Um, so just bear with me. It's a big bushy grass, but at the seedling stage, it looks a lot like maize. Um, so Tripsicum overwinters in temp temperate climates. Um, there's two main species that are endemic to North America, Tripsicum dactyloides and Tripsicum floridanum. Um, see their distributions down on the bottom right hand uh, side of the plot here. I'm trying to stand right in front of that. Um, yeah, so it present, uh, uh, possesses a great degree of, uh, of natural variation for freezing tolerance, which exceeds that of maize. Um, it's very closely related to maize, uh, having diverged around 1.2 million years ago, um, and it shares a whole genome duplication of that with maize. Um, they're even uh, cross compatible, although um, it's very tricky to get a viable uh, cross out of the two. Um, and it hasn't undergone a domestication bottleneck, although I'll point out the Tripscum floridanum is um, isolated to basically the southern tip of Florida. The whole state's highlighted here, but really it's just found in a few counties down on the southern tip. Um, so that population actually did undergo not a domestication bottleneck, um, uh, but, but we expect that uh, the hypothesis is that in the last ice age, um, essentially uh, uh, it, was, it was trapped in a refugia on the southern tip of Florida there. Um, and so it, uh, we expect it to have a much smaller effective population size than Tripsicum dactyloides, which is found uh, from North America all the way through Central America and down into the, um, uh, uh, well, South America, I believe Peru. Uh, there are natural um, populations. So uh, just to talk a little bit about the mapping population here, this is largely the work of uh, Christy Galt and Nick Lepic. Um, Christy Galt was a former postdoc in the Buckler Lab. Um, essentially, we had a number of um, Tripsicum dactyloides and Tripsicum floridanum collections that were made by uh, Denise Kostich, um, who was our former lab manager. Um, and a series of crosses were made between um, northern varieties, of Trips Tripsicum dactyloides, um, and then uh, Tripsicum floridanum. Um, these were made uh, reciprocally, um, but essentially, uh, we just picked the, uh, uh, the F1s that were viable, and we selected one plant um, per family from each viable cross. Uh, we ended up with 53 uh, F1s that were then uh, clonally propagated. Um, as Tripsicum is a perennial, you can just basically cut it in half and plant the two halves, and you have, um, uh, yeah, you have, you have a clone. Um, and then the F2s have been allowed, um, I'm sorry, the F1s have been allowed to uh, open pollinate in the field for the last several years, and we collect the seed off of those F1s, and we use that for our freezing screen. Um, and we're taking a bulk segregant um, analysis approach here, uh, where we um, subject um, the F2 seed, which has been germinated under greenhouse conditions, um, to first cold acclimation, followed by um, like a, uh, essentially a, a hard frost um, at minus 8 degrees C uh, overnight. So temperature slowly ramps down, and they get three hours of hard freeze. We let them recover a little bit, and then we uh, mm -hmm. phenotype them um, basically for their uh, maintenance of, of, of green leaf area. 
Um, so you can see uh, some sad plants on the left in the susceptible bulk and um, happy plants on the right in the tolerant bulk. Uh, so we take um, essentially the tails of the phenotypic distribution, we pull tissue, uh, and then we sequence them. Um, now, um, the question uh, arises, what do we map them to? Um, it is possible to map these reads to maize, but um, as I said before, um, the, the genomes, uh, while they have a lot in common, um, there's fundamentally different architecture. Uh, Trypsicum has 18 chromosomes and a 3.5 gigabase genome, uh, while maize has a 2.3 gigabase genome and only 10 chromosomes. Uh, so that motivates me to try to assemble a Trypsicum genome. Um, and the technology we picked was nanopore reads. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, Trypsicum and maize genomes are highly repetitive, uh, about 85 or greater percent on repeat content. Uh, so that makes short read assembly um, a challenge, um, or at least an expensive proposition. Um, nanopore reads uh, can reach um, lengths of up to 200 uh, base pair, uh, 200,000 base pairs, um, and so can potentially span um, intergenic regions. So what we're looking at on the bottom right here, where it says maize intergenic regions, that's a distribution of the um, uh, distance between uh, consecutive sets of maize genes in the B73 genome. Um, and then on the top, we're looking at uh, the distribution of minion reads, and you can see that they nicely cover um, the intergenic regions. So uh, this is a technology that can uh, potentially span those gaps um, and allow us to assemble um, a structurally um, a complete um, uh, trypsicum genome. Uh, the drawback for nanopore reads is their high error rate of around 15%, uh, which um, is far worse than Illumina. Um, but fortunately, there are new algorithms that are designed to account for this. Um, and so about 30x of, uh, of uh, long reads greater than 10 KB is what is typically recommended for assembly. And I'll show you the results we've gotten uh, using that approach. Uh, so just a quick overview of our assembly pipeline here. Um, so we start with our long reads um, and, we feed, and we feed those into a, a software program called uh, WTDBG2, uh, which is uh, incredibly fast. Um, we tried a number of other um, assembly algorithms, uh, including uh, Canoe, which um, is probably more well known MiniSM, uh, Fly, and then MeCat. Um, and essentially with the size of this data set, we're talking about 100 gigabases of reads uh, or 200 gigabyte, uh, gigabytes worth of files. Um, the, the memory requirements for overlapping all of the reads against each other uh, were prohibitive. So none of the other approaches worked. WTDBG2 not only worked, uh, but it worked quickly. Um, so out from WTDBG, we get um, raw contigs, so just sort of draft, um, still high error rate contigs. Um, and what we do is we take the long reads and we map them back to those contigs. Um, and we use a program uh, called Raycon to essentially call consensus in the contigs. And that improves the accuracy. And we do this iteratively uh, one to three times uh, while the accuracy continues to improve. I'll talk in a, in a, a moment about um, how we benchmark that accuracy. And the final step is to throw some short reads on top. Um, again, those short Illumina um, low error rate reads uh, and use those to, um, you know, to, 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 to correct the, the, the residual uh, base pair error, um, any base pair inaccuracies that, that remain in the um, Raycon corrected assembly. Uh, and out from that, we get uh, corrected contigs. These typically are um, much more fragmented than a chromosome scale assembly, um, but they do contain a lot of structural information. Okay. So um, yeah, the performance of uh, that whole pipeline depends a lot on genome characteristics and the input data. Um, here is a, a, a collaboration that we did with uh, Ilad Oren. Um, he's in Amit Gore's group uh, from Hebrew U. Um, and this is a much smaller, less complex genome than Trypsicum or Maze, um, about 450 megabases with far lower repeat contents. Um, and 30x worth of um, long read coverage on this is 13 and a half uh, gigabases, uh, which works out to roughly one minion flow cell. Um, so that's uh, a very small amount of data uh, for the nanopore. Uh, by contrast, we need uh, about 10, uh, well, seven to 10, depending on yields um, of these flow cells to get the same coverage for uh, a gene on the size of maize. Um, right, so the resource usage uh, in terms of compute time is minimal. Um, on a, a medium memory CVSU um, a high performance uh, uh, computer um, or computing server. Um, it took about 500 CPU hours, but just in terms of like wall clock time, this ran in about a day. Um, and the assembly size was about 85% of what was expected. Um, and the, uh, uh, when aligning this assembly um, to the uh, uh, Cucumis Mello reference, um, we can see that it's generally collinear. Um, there's a little bit of off diagonal, uh, but it, it, it aligns very well. It tiles most of the assembly. Um, and then down here on the right, we're looking at um, a Busco plot, 
um, and what this is, uh, BUSCO stands for Benchmarking Universal Single Copy Orthologs. But it's, it's just telling you how many of the single copy genes that are uh, conserved uh, within the uh, embryophyta seed plants um, are present and uh, correctly assembled within your assembly. So we can see that for the reference genome um, uh, versus the polished assembly, they have very similar numbers. We're just looking at the size of the blue bar versus the red bar. So it looks very good there. Um, now maize uh, P39 and Tripscum floridanum, um, these are two assemblies that uh, I've been working on. Um, maize P39 more as a test case because um, it's inbred and uh, we have a closer reference in B73. Um, the compute time is substantially longer, uh, but the clock time um, is again only one to two days. Um, so we're really uh, talking about very rapid genome assembly here. Um, and the contiguity we get out of these is not quite as good as we get uh, with the smaller, less repetitive genome. Uh, but we are getting uh, 400 uh, kilobases uh, worth of contigs, or 400 kilobases um, and 50. So that's saying half of our assembly is in contigs that size or larger. Um, okay, so again, another Busco plot. We're looking at these two assemblies, maize P39 and Tripscum floridanum. Um, and we're just looking at the improvement of the Busco score as we iteratively polish with Raycon. Um, and we can see that um, the uh, uh, assembly um, doesn't much improve with uh, uh, repeated rounds of Raycon, uh, but once we throw the short reads on there with uh, uh, Pylon, uh, we get close to, to the reference completeness. Um, and the same is true for Tripscum floridanum. Uh, now, uh, here is some work that uh, Baosheng Song, uh, my colleague, uh, postdoc in the Buckler Lab did. Um, he designed uh, an alternative um, to, to Busco called Tabasco, where we basically take um, a wider set of genes um, from the Andropogonia, so more specific to maize and Tripsicum, uh, and we align them at the nucleotide level rather than um, at the protein level. Um, and so it's a little bit less sensitive to base pair errors. Um, and we can see that essentially uh, uh, the, the gene space that is not being picked up by Basco, uh, or sorry, by Busco as complete, um, is actually there. Um, so uh, even before we polish anything, we do have uh, the building blocks of a complete assembly. Um, so this is a way that we can rapidly um, check uh, uh, where our assemblies are at. Um, it helps us with tuning parameters and iterating. Okay, so then just a couple of whole genome alignments. So once we have these assemblies, we wanna know how good we did. Um, so uh, we take our assemblies and we align them against uh, some kind of reference, as I showed before with QCumus Mello versus the uh, uh, reference gene on there. Um, so these are, uh, again, the maize P39 assembly and the Tripscum Floridanum assembly uh, aligned against the maize B73. Uh, that's our sort of uh, platinum quality reference genome. Um, and we can see that the, the features are very similar. Um, I think I don't have time to get into what's going on in these uh, little uh, red circles here, but essentially um, there's a lot of duplication in the maize genome inherently, as I said before, uh, and we're picking it up in both the Tripsicum and the maize assemblies. Um, so that's something I'm gonna have to dig into a little bit further. Uh, another characteristic to note is that this is slightly darker red and this is uh, a more orange here. So we have higher percent identity in the maize assembly against maize than the Tripsicum assembly against maize. So uh, in summary, um, our assemblies show good uh, contiguity and collinearity uh, with the reference genome. So we can produce them quickly. Um, and that shows that uh, de novo nanopore assembly is tractable for uh, large repetitive um, genomes. Uh, however, whole genome alignment re remains problematic and we're still uh, looking at strategies to benchmark our assemblies and assess their completeness and accuracy. Um, yeah, uh, we're also looking for higher depth alumina um, for our assemblies uh, that will help us uh, to polish more accurately. Uh, for Tripscum, we only have about 3x, which is less than the minimum needed to polish. Um, and then at some point, I need to get around to actually mapping freezing tolerance. Um, and uh, an interesting evolutionary question would be how um, genome fractionation has uh, uh, proceeded in uh, uh, Tripsicum versus maize. Um, so yeah, um, just in summation, I'd like to thank everyone in the Buckler Lab. I think I got all the names up there. We have a big lab right now. Um, Christy Galtz uh, was the one who originated this project. She's now at Inari. Um, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank my committee who didn't make it up here. Uh, on the yeah, anyway. <laughs> but I'd like to thank everyone, so, yeah, so, yeah, to, to, to yeah, to, um, uh, yeah, uh, Elad Oren, Baoshing Song, uh, Sinta, and Nick Lepak, uh, especially. So, thank you all. Take your questions. So, you mentioned that it's difficult to to so the question was, um, if, the, if, if it's difficult to cross maize and tripsicum, how do we propose moving uh, any traits that we identify into maize? And the answer would be genome editing. 
Um, if we can identify um, yeah, specific alleles, um, then we can, um, yeah, the, the, the plan is to, is to attempt to um, edit them, uh, both in a, a freezing um, susceptible background and, and induce freezing tolerance, and then eventually into maize. Yeah. You might have mentioned this, and I might have missed it, but why did you decide to assemble Floridana instead of the Exoides? Was it just because it probably has, has that geographical bottleneck? Uh, so the question was, why did we pick Tripscum Floridanum to assemble and not Dactylodes? Uh, and the answer is, uh, we actually picked both. Um, the reason this particular um, species and one particular line from the species came up is that it's uh, the majority, it, it, it's apparent in, uh, I think, 25 to 30 percent of the F1s that we have out in the field, so it's it's alleles are overrepresented in the population. But we do have further plans to to sequence um, the dactyloides and others. Much thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.